I'm Ruth Bush. I'm a, a vascular surgeon. I do mainly venous work at the Central Texas VA. Uh, I'm also the Vice Dean for Academic Affairs at Texas A&M College of Medicine. So in your slide set that you're going to get and have access to, this slide set's actually about 60 slides long. But since I have 15 minutes to give you pretty much an entire textbook, I've hidden a lot of those slides, but you will have access to them for your review and if you have any questions. I am too short to see over this and see what I'm looking at. Okay, maybe it's this one. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Maybe it's this thing. Okay, no disclosures. Okay, so just a little bit about varicose veins. And the one thing I do know, who are the second year fellows in here? None? Okay, so probably not many of you do a lot of venous disease right now. Do many of you? No, you're all learning how to do thoraco, abdominals, and endovascular cases. You will wait until the last two weeks of your training, and then you're going to go to your attending and say, I got to learn dialysis access and venous disease, because you know that you're probably not going to get those thoraco referrals your first week or month in practice. So that's when you're going to learn about venous disease. The good thing is, it's not hard. What you do need to do is gain some experience and gain rapport with patients because some of the patients are a little bit different than the ones who have a life-threatening disease like thoracoabdominal. So it's incredibly common, uh, and symptomatic venous disease is very much more common. It used to be that most of the cases we saw were cosmetic, but uh, the Internet is on everybody's telephone, and people know what the buzzwords are. Uh, to get into your clinic and to also get insurance to pay for it. And most of your patients, as I have here, are going to be bilateral, so it's important for you to be able to not only look at their symptomatic leg, but look at their other leg and then help them predict when it's time to come in for repair. So the clinical presentation can be variable. Patients may not have pain. They may just complain of tiredness, heaviness. If they work in a standing vocation, a hairdresser, a nurse, a teacher. I practice in Central Texas where there's a lot of prisons, so I take care of a lot of correctional officers. People who are on their feet a lot of the time, ranchers, for example, uh, may have heaviness by the end of the day. Symptoms are better in the morning, worse at the end of the day. Uh, they may actually have some itching over the veins and get what's called venous eczema. Uh, the uh, CF classification uh, is a classification that's mainly for us in terms of the CEANP, which is uh, clinical etiology, uh, anatomy, and pathophysiology, the E and A and P we don't usually use in terms of uh, grading a patient except for research projects and uh, to talk among ourselves and to look at guidelines. It's maybe mainly the C, and you will probably have to report the C, the clinical classification to your insurance companies to be able to describe they uh, understand those listings. So I don't even know why we have a C0 because that's normal. Uh, so C1 is basically the spider veins that people will have. Uh, those are not covered by insurance. Uh, C2 are just varicose veins that are asymptomatic. C3 is when you start having classic symptoms, so swelling, uh, some pain. When you get to C4, you're starting to have more of the classic symptoms you might see if you're the intern going to Unaboot Clinic, where you see the lipodermatosclerosis and the hemosiderin staining around the ankles, and the skin starts feeling a little woody, and that's from the fibrin deposition. You know, the uh, hypertension in the veins will push the red blood cells and fibrin out into the surrounding tissue, and it makes it stiff. And the hemosiderin, as I tell my patients, it's a rust stain because you have red blood cells with iron and it's staining their skin. And those things probably will not improve by uh, taking care of uh, venous disease or fixing their reflux. It may get a little bit better, but probably not going to improve. Uh, C5 is a healed ulcer, and then C6 is an active ulcer. So these are the basic one through five that you would need to know. So in terms of presentation, women are more prone to developing symptoms. Maybe women complain more. I don't know, but women are the ones that tend to come in a little bit more. Uh, men will develop symptoms after they, their varicose veins reach a little bit larger uh, size. They tend to wait a little more uh, till they're more progressed. Uh, again, symptoms are usually worse at, the, worse at the end of the day and common in patients who have uh, standing jobs. 
Uh, as I tell patients, you know, you're probably not going to die from your varicose veins. Most of the procedures that we do are elective procedures. Uh, patients who have ulceration, another class of patients, and I encourage you to read a little bit more uh, on your own about that because I don't have enough time to go into uh, venous ulcerations in the course of that. And then again, 33% uh, will seek uh, uh, your care for cosmesis. However, when you actually start probing them and giving them some more questions about how their legs feel, uh, you may elicit some more symptoms. Uh, a lot of different risk factors that go along with venous disease. In men, I usually tell them there's a large genetic component that can also be uh, with women as well. And I'll just leave you uh, these risk factors to uh, read on your own. You got to know the anatomy. Anatomy is logical. If my students from A&M or residents now remember, anatomy is logical. Uh, the <clears throat> name veins, the main veins, you need to know there's a lot of other veins because venous anatomy can be variable. You can have duplicated saphenous veins, you can have duplicated deep veins. So you need to just know the course. And the course, knowing the course of the veins and then where you see the patterns of varicosities that show up on the skin will give you an idea of what the underlying problem might be. So for example, somebody comes in with a classic distribution of say a cluster of varicosities on their calf, I know that that's in the distribution of the great saphenous vein. If they're on the lateral aspect of the calf, that's more in the distribution of the small saphenous vein. So you will learn to recognize these patterns. Uh, do know that the small saphenous vein is one of the axial veins in the leg that can have a variable terminus. So the great saphenous vein is always going to terminate at the saphenofemoral junction. Very rarely would it, and I've never seen it not terminate there, but the small saphenous vein empties into the popliteal fossa, but it can empty up a little bit higher on the thigh, or it may not stop at all and just have some perforators to the deep system. So that's one vein if you're treating, you need to be able to know where it's emptying into the deep system. Again, uh, the, this is fairly common physiology, but you know that veins have valves to keep the blood going towards your heart or in between heart and keep it from backing down in between heartbeats. So the valves will become disrupted as the uh, venous hypertension approaches a valve. It'll stretch those valves out. The leaflets will not come together. And if you remember looking inside a vein when you were in anatomy lab, you'll remember that the venous valves are about the uh, consistency of wet tissue paper, so they're very fine. So any damage, if somebody's had a deep venous thrombosis or if they've had superficial venous thrombosis, those valves can become damaged and thickened and foreshortened very easily. So you also need to recognize patterns of reflux. So a lot of ultrasound labs may only look at the saphenofemoral junction for saphenofemoral re reflux, but the deep system and the superficial system are connected by perforating veins up and down the leg like rungs in a ladder. And so it may be that the reflux can start mid-thigh, it can start at the knee, uh, or it can start up at the saphenofemoral junction. Just remember, you need to do a thorough ultrasound exam, and I'll mention that. So we have a lot of different current treatments, and the goals are to address the underlying uh, pathophysiology. We also need to figure out where the reflux is. Again, the patterns of reflux you need to recognize. So your patients are going to expect you to make an accurate diagnosis, set a treatment plan, and you got to be realistic. Not everybody's going to come out looking like that, but if you Google, uh, if you Google uh, or do a search on vein centers, that's the picture they always have. Something like that. I think I stole that from Dr. Lumsden, actually. <laughs> from his website. So a lot of insurance companies want you to start by doing what's called conservative therapy. So, and it can be for six weeks, three months, six months, depending on the uh, carrier. And so you're gonna have the patients, uh, you know, practice or elevating their legs while they're at work. Some people can't do that. You can't exactly tell the hairdresser you've got to sit down a few times during the day. People have to make a living. But you also need to put them in compression stockings. And companies, insurance companies for approval are going to want to know that you've had them in prescription grade elastic compression stockings. Um, and that's a whole other discussion in terms of uh, what type of stockings in the grade. 
But the one thing that you can do by wearing the, having your patients wear the compression stockings is find out if their symptoms get better when they wear the stockings. And that'll help you know that if, you're treat, if you treat them, that it's going to work and it's actually going to help them. So there's, I'll just go quickly through the different types of treatment we have now. Uh, I'm not going to mention old-fashioned how I learned uh, uh, vein stripping, high ligation and stripping. There may be a, a time where you would have to do that, but I think it's beyond the scope of this talk. But there are uh, different ways to ablate the vein. Uh, and there's thermal ways and there's non-thermal ways, and I'll just mention them. With uh, thermal energy heat, there's two different forms of heat that can be delivered to the vein to ablate it. Uh, that's radio frequency or endovenous laser. Uh, there's one radio frequency company that I know of. Lasers can be multiple different wavelengths. Uh, you mainly want to do a duplex ultrasound first to know your pattern of reflux, you know if the patient has any uh, thrombus in their deep system, in their superficial system. You want to know what veins are refluxing, saphenous veins, small saphenous vein, deep system, accessory veins as well. Uh, insurance companies want to know how much reflux, and they consider normal reflux less, and we consider normal reflux less than half a second, 500 milliseconds. So. Some companies require you actually to submit your reports. Some want some pictures. Some just go on your word. Uh, so just a normal venous scan would be when you compress. So say you've got the ultrasound probe up on someone's thigh looking at their saphenous vein. You squeeze their calf. You'll see a little bit of reflux as the valves are closing because there is some closing time. So as you squeeze, uh, blood will shoot through the valve and then it closes. When you have reflux, you will squeeze and you'll see blood flowing for a while and that's how we measure it, by how far and what the marks are on the ultrasound scan. Make sense? Okay. So patients who may not do well, of course, if somebody's symptoms are not resolved by compression stockings, however, I will warn you that um, in 110 degree July, nobody is happy with compression stockings. But patients who've had a history of superficial thrombophlebitis, uh, it may be hard to treat them and may be actually be impossible to treat if they've had thrombophlebitis in one of their main axial veins. Those who've had a deep venous thrombosis, I want to know if it's occlusive or non-occlusive. I do not want to ablate someone who has superficial venous occlusion or I don't want to ablate someone and take out their superficial sim uh, system if they have a completely thrombosed deep system. Uh, because they do need some flow out of their leg. Uh, patients with a history of ulceration, uh, again, another talk. They probably need to have some type of treatment, but you also need to make sure they don't have any pelvic vein reflux. So uh, one of the thermal uh, uh, techniques is the closure fast catheter by Venus, which is, who are they owned now by? Medtronic, I believe. Uh, it's a seven French catheter. You put a, just a standard sheath in that you all do for your endovascular cases. Uh, very easy to see under ultrasound, and it segmentally treats the vein, and it's uh, fairly fast. And as I described to my patients, you know, we're cauterizing the inside of a vein, and I described to them we're sealing it shut like sealing a Ziploc bag. Uh, because they want to know if you're removing the vein. And you're not removing it, you're just sealing it shut. It becomes fibrotic over time. Some the thinner patients can feel a cord in their thigh, which will get smaller over time. Uh, there's laser therapy. Again, multiple different catheters on the market, multiple different wavelengths. These heat up a lot higher. The radio frequency will heat to 120 centigrade. The lasers can heat up much, much higher, several hundreds of centigrade. But they're basically similar techniques. Uh, in terms of how you perform them. Post-procedure, the patients need to wear some type of compression wrap, whether it's uh, compression stockings or ACE bandages. Uh, I have them wear them for about two weeks. Once they're, if they're a little sore, I won't have them put on their stocking. I just have them use an ACE bandage uh, when walking. I find that men don't want to wear thigh highs or pantyhose stockings. So for men, I have them wear a uh, knee-high stocking and then some compression shorts that they can get at Academy or some other sports. <coughs> there are some complications. There's no free lunch in this world. Patients will have bruising. They will 
may have a little bit of bleeding from their puncture site. Uh, if you're doing the lower aspect of the leg in the saphenous vein or the uh, small saphenous vein, there's little nerves that run there, the sural nerve and the saphenous nerve, and they could have some paresthesias. Those are usually self-limited. If they have secondary varicosities, you may, uh, they may get phlebitis by the secondary varicosities thrombosing uh, without good compression. Uh, some hyperpigmentation uh, may occur as the hemosiderin leaks out of their ablated vein over time. Burns are very, very rare. And uh, DVT is also very rare. Uh, this is what uh, a clot looks like in a vein after doing ablation. This is one of my patients who came back for their post-op ultrasound. See a little tongue of thrombus extending into their main vein. Uh, there's a whole system of grading called EHIT, endovenous thermal induced thrombosis. It's grades one through four on how much thrombus is in the deep system. Usually this retracts within a week. Uh, I describe post-op uh, care and post-treatment imaging. Some people will not image the patients unless they come back with symptoms. I have everyone have an ultrasound scan within the first week of their treatment. Uh, at six months, there is some recanalization reported in the literature, you know, four to five percent. However, most of these patients are not symptomatic, even if they've recanalized. Uh, clinical course, it's I'll let you read about that because I'm getting blinked at here. And when to perform secondary procedures. Uh, you can perform phlebectomies. Some people will do one-stop shopping and do the ablation and the phlebectomies at a time. Depending on your patient, the studies have shown that if you can wait three to four months, only 40% of those patients will actually need phlebectomies because the veins will shrink over time. So it really depends on you and your patient and the, the conversations you have about their time. Uh, just pictures. Um, really, all wavelengths and radio frequency have about the same outcomes. It's just what you're comfortable with and uh, your experience level. Uh, just briefly, there are uh, a couple of new non-thermal, non-tumescent techniques. One is called Clarivane. It's like a little wire whisk that whips around and denudes the endothelium as you're injecting sclerosant. And then there is Venoseal, which injects cyanoacrylate glue into the vein to seal it shut. Both of these are nice because there's no capital outlay. So if you're at a place like the VA that doesn't, where I am, which doesn't want to spend any money, these are disposable items so you don't have to buy uh, anything to uh, uh, a generator or anything. Um, I would encourage you all, since these talks are so short and nobody learns about venous disease until you're at the end, is there are some fellows courses offered by the American Venus Forum. There's two fellows co vein courses per year. These are very well done. I'm getting kicked off the stage. So get some more training. Thank you.